Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Second in Command, a Veep Rewatch podcast. My name is Timothy Simons. I play Jonah Ryan on the television show Veep. My name is uh, Matt Walsh, and I play Mike McClintock. You and... played Mike, Mike McClintock. We're no longer filming. What? What are you saying? You said the present tense. You said the present tense, but you played. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, wow, maybe I was hopeful thinking. Yeah, it's okay. Uh, you're listening to uh, Second in Command, a podcast about Veep as dimly perceived through the veil of memory. <laughs> it's a, that was Lou Morton that wrote that for yeah. us. Yeah, it's pretty poetic. It's, isn't, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. we've the stuck veil with it. of memory. Did you ever read the Thin Black Veil? No. It's uh, E.B. Dubo, e. Dubois. Mm-hmm. Dubois. Mm-hmm. It's a great book. Just okay. a, just in terms of veil. Have you ever seen The Thin Red Line? The yes, Malik? Uh, yeah, so good. I just saw it, uh, I watched it like six months ago. It's so fucking good. Do you have a random association with Tim's random association? <sighs> thin black, thin red line? Yeah, no, no, I mean, no. I think about myself as being very, very thin, but uh, <laughs> that's all that comes to mind. Uh, this is a little bit, <laughs> um, I recently saw like one of those, you know, like- the Have we introduced th- Nelson? We'll get there. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I saw a sticker on the back of somebody's car that was like, you know how they have like the cop uh, thin blue line oh, yeah. mm-hmm. things? Yeah. There was one for firemen that was like a thin red line. It was like, what? nobody's mad at firemen. Yeah, wait. Nobody's fucking, I mean, like if you guys started showing up and like setting houses on fire, yeah. we'd be like, all right, guys, maybe let's rethink some of this. But like nobody's mad at firemen. I agree, and if I was a cop, I would be like, oh yeah, all firemen are great guys. Yeah, yeah. every single fireman's a great guy. They're all angels, and he- that's how I would feel, because they're exalted. They're always like, yes, mm-hmm. everyone loves firemen. I totally agree with that stereotype. Yeah. yeah. They run into burning buildings, so they get some credit. So Tim, today we have Nelson Franklin, who plays, what's the full name of his character? Uh, Will DeVries. It's, <laughs> I was told by Dave, and I, you know, I don't think it was ever proven. Oh, it was on my name tag. Oh, it was on your name tag. That's right. What was it? Will Nelson. So, ah, they're so lazy with names. He thought it would be funny if my name was Willie Nelson. So that's. <laughs> it didn't. And also yeah. your first name. And oh yeah, my first name is Nelson too. So they're so lazy with so, Gary Walsh. There's yes. a bunch of yeah, lazy yeah. like name. Tra- uh, what Tim Simon? Look, call him Simon something. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay, so Will Nelson, <laughs> Willie Nelson, uh, played by uh, Nelson Franklin, who's mm-hmm. here in studio with us, uh, longtime friend of the show. I was remembering this on the way here today. Friend of the show. You don't listen to this podcast. I've listened to the podcast. Have I mean, you? I'm, the podcast. I'm friends with the people who participate yeah. in the show. You yeah, know? but I mean, d- it, don't like brag like we well, have a lot of fans of this. Uh, no, I mean, I think <laughs> in my head I was thinking friend of Veep. Yeah, yeah. Also, yeah. like he said before that he's listened to the I show. Have, yeah. Okay. All right. No, yeah, you I don't, don't have know to. If he's like hit and play every week. Yeah, yeah. That's okay. Yeah. We have some fans of the show. But it it's is. Okay. You know, honest to God, it's like the same thing about we were talking about Oppenheimer. I have a two-year-old now, and sometimes I can't do the full like hour and a half. This is a longer. Of course, it's, it's a longer podcast. You know what I mean? But yeah. uh, I maybe we should it. shorten it, Tim. I mean, no. that Nelson's like giving us feedback. I'm not every minute, he's giving us notes. Is, every yo, yeah. Oh, what else should we do, Nelson? <laughs> oh. When I first saw how long it was, I was like, oh, this is gonna be great to do one day because I'm always I feel like we're well, always sort of reined in in these podcasts. They're all trying to make it a half hour or whatever. But this is, yeah. you know, we can feel free. Coming into this. I was like, oh, we know we should like really keep it short. I don't know. That's no fun. <laughs> we had a first. We had. Is this going to be before Peter? This is going to be before Peter. Yeah. All right. I won't. Talk, I won't spoil it. Or well, it's I coming up. You, I think you just. Did. <laughs> Peter McNichol, who <laughs> plays Uncle Jeff. Oh yeah. What's that guy's last name? Is it the same uh, as Ryan? Jeff Kane. Jeff Kane. Uh-huh. Yeah. He did his first ever podcast. He came in here. He's never done a podcast. He's wow. never listened he's to never a podcast. He's never listened to a podcast. <laughs> I mean, he's I, like well, top three favorite characters on the show for sure. Yeah. Isn't he though? Yeah. It's yeah. crazy. I feel like we did, uh, you know, we kind of pride ourselves on not preparing, even though we do. Mm-hmm. I don't know that we prepared enough for Peter mm-hmm. because I, on the way home, was like, I completely forgot to ask him about not only like the Emmy wins. I know. Had. Like oh, we forgot. Right. Did and he win for our show? No. And oh. then I completely forgot to have them talk. Have him talk about the story about how he was, he was nominated for our show, but it was the uh, I'm eating so much pussy I'm shitting clits. <laughs> that scene 
that got thrown in in episode nine meant that he was in like half or more of the episodes. Made him a which regular. Meant, which made it, which meant that he couldn't be a guest nominated star? for guest star. No. So he was nominated for guest star. And then they pulled it. And then they had to pull it because he was in Jesus. that. And it was like nine seconds. So if of, you appear in more than half of a season, yes, something like that, wow. Then you would be considered a supporting actor in that show, not mm. just a guest actor. Yeah. Wow. That's really how interesting. I, coincidentally, that's how I won my SAG award. I was in more than 50% of the episodes on the season. You guys won best cast. And oh, so yeah. So I was able to get an award for that. Even oh, though. isn't that great? Yeah. And you were up there on stage with us, I right? was, yeah. yeah. I yeah. got the picture and everything. Yeah, Hell yeah. yeah. I have that a SAG awesome. award somewhere. Yeah. But that's a heavy one. It's unbelievable. Pewter. Yeah. You've got to carry it around for like 12 hours. It's shocking. Yeah, uh, it's really heavy. One thing that we pride ourselves on, I think, is relating to the everyman mm -hmm. and talking about how hard it is <laughs> and how heavy your entertainment <laughs> awards are is something that really connects you with the everyman. Well, maybe the only entertainment award I have. So. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, I carried that motherfucker around all night. You could kill someone with that. That's like a total weapon. I would. Yeah. And I think, honestly, they would probably, if I, if somebody was like, I'm going to kill you with the SAG award to be like look I prefer it to be an Oscar but like honestly any <laughs> entertainment award would be pretty good like I'd be killed by one sure yeah if yeah. I hear a noise at night in the house I'm going to grab the SAG award and see who's oh, coming good well, idea. I bought a bat just for that reason axe I have an axe for that reason oh wow like hand no, axe, axe or full axe wow yeah I keep a it's like a minute this is so stupid because I didn't buy it it was actually a, a prize I won but it's like mm -hmm. a a short blade, like a samurai sword, but it's like a half size one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my bed. How did you? How did you come to win a half size samurai sword? Uh, I used to go to. Uh, I'm friendly with Jayma Mays and her husband Adam Campbell. Mm -hmm. uh, she played my wife on the CBS sitcom The Millers, mm -hmm. and they have a Christmas party every year. Uh, and they would do trivia. It was, it was like a pub trivia Christmas party. I loved it. It was so fun. And they would give out awards throughout the night for whoever won. So there would be like a winner of the whole thing. But if, if a team won a round, you got to pick a, a gift. And this one year, they were all weapons. It was like a crossbow, a sword. Oh, my <laughs> God. Wow. It was like all stuff. They they were like, we got all this on uh, Amazon, guys. You can get all this shit on Amazon. And uh, but they were all small versions of those. Ways. That's how, that's okay. how I got it. Yeah. We're talking like a, little, like a little mini crossbow? Yeah. Deadly, though? Like small arrows? I sure. don't know. I guess. If, I would assume. If it hit the right spot, sure. Yeah. Or the right eyeball or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> I love the people. I love having friends who can organize stuff like that. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, oh, you're such good friends. It was a gag gift, but I, I don't know if people kept them or not. I mean, I kept mine. You still have sure. yours. Yeah, now sure. you have a child that you can protect with that. <laughs> oh, my God. Sword. Lock it up. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Lock it up. Yeah. Or put it, um, up, put it up high. Mm -hmm. This was something that I was remembering this morning, that, Nelson, you were an audition reader <laughs> yeah. for V, weren't you? I was, yeah. I'm sure that greased the wheels a little bit. Uh, Allison Jones called me late at night on a Sunday, like at 10 p.m. on a Sunday, and was like, oh, I had Zach Woods as a reader tomorrow because, you know, he's friends with Armando for many years and stuff. And and his, uh, tragically, his grandmother had passed away and he had to, like, leave town that day. And she was left with no reader. So she called me at the 11th hour and I read a bunch of people uh, for your role, Matt. It was like... <gasps> It was like, that early on, so yeah. before the show started. Oh yeah, no, it was wow. like for the pilot. Yeah, so it's like first round auditions. Yeah, and uh, were, were, you, were you in the room when I auditioned? I know, I would have remembered for sure. Um, I don't remember any of those auditions. Really. I can't. We read. I was there for like six hours and read a bunch of people, notably like Colin Hanks, Sean Astin. Um, who else was wow. in there? I think Seth came in. Uh, Seth Morris. I mean, I like uh, that I beat Sean Astin. That's like a famous. <laughs> yeah, that's a famous guy. Yeah. I and, can I a quick digression. Mm -hmm. I I ran into Sean Astin at the airport. Mm. Uh, anyway, uh, the kids had just seen Lord of the Rings. We had just <laughs> recently mm. watched all three of them, and they they were like they were super fucking starstruck because they were like, "Is that Samwise Gamgee?" And mm. I was like, "Yeah." And they did like a, the kind of cute thing. He, anyway, this all comes down to he had the best response to a kid saying that they liked the movie. He like they like they went up to him and they were like, "We really liked you in Lord of the Rings. We really liked those movies." And he did this really funny thing where he was like, "Oh, you you liked it?" Ah. Oh. Whew, and he like wiped the sweat from his head and like kind of shook it off. And he was like, I mean, it was like really cute, cute. and endearing. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, you know, he's got a lot of experience with that. I'm sure. I'm going yeah, sure. yeah. to steal that. I'm going to steal that. It's really good. That's right? a good one. Yeah. yeah. It's like yeah. a bit of clowning for them too. Yes. You get them a little laugh. So 
So you were Colin Hanks, Sean Astin. Yeah. One notable thing that Armando, did, I'm gonna, I keep calling him Armando. I don't know how you guys like to pronounce his name. It is Armando. It Armando. Is. Yeah. I called him Arma Armando for many years until I heard him say his own name out loud, and I was like, oh fuck, he would he would never correct me or whatever. But anyway, Armando said to me, I want you to improvise with these people, and they are they were not told that you're gonna do that. You you know just go off whenever you find that it's an easy. But, and of course, you know, I'm shitting bricks here. He's here, and there's the, it's like Frank is there. So I don't. There were people in the room where I was like, "Oh my god, I gotta like repeatedly be funny in front of these guys." And so, and without naming names, you know, a lot of the people who read were very excited and would ad lib and stuff. And then some of them would like glare at me. <laughs> <laughs> I know. And hey then, man, why are you ruining my audition? And then like get back on the. And it's like, what do you think's going on here? You think I'm just like fucking around, like in your, <laughs> yeah. in, your in your in your producer session with. <laughs> Like then they're cool with it. Like this is the reason for this, my man, and and you failed, you know. And I'm obviously I can't say, but some of the older guys who came in for the. Role I mean that makes sense in that like, there are like some generational differences. Yeah. I think just in like how these things are made. Like even just somebody if you're used to shooting on film, you have like twelve minutes <laughs> of roll in there. Like you can't. It, it isn't just like leave it turning and right. we'll talk about it while it's running. It's very right. true. Very it, true. Yeah, like you just rehearse it a bunch of times and you shoot it a few, and now it's just like I don't know. This is the rehearsal. Throw cameras up. In this episode, in we are obviously five talking five. about episode five, uh, season five, episode five, Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. Yes, there is a shot in here where I clearly have like a cough drop or a snack in my mouth. <laughs> I didn't catch it. Uh, and it's like it's in the White House mess scene. Yeah. And I'm sure that they were just like, oh, yeah, well, I mean, we're just going to put cameras up for this one. Uh -huh. But like, you know, like it's just we're just feeling it out. Shoot or the rehearsal. And it's just so clearly like this little glob on like the right side of my face. I'm like, I'm just eating. I'm just <laughs> eating in that shot. I thought this was Reed's coverage. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, you're in the cafeteria. Look, I watched this like an hour before I came here. I had Perfect. no idea. I did not see that at all. So there you go. I, yeah, I didn't notice it. I wanted to ask you, Nelson, what's kind of your journey into Veep, like your mm -hmm. kind of acting history or, you know, just to... Yeah, so, <clears throat> you know, um, this show was cast by Allison Jones, one of the, you know, greatest casting directors of all time, or or at least I see her that way because of how kind she's been to me and the she people is great. I love. And she stuff. casts yeah. good movies, too. She's amazing, yeah. Uh, you know, type Allison Jones into IMDb to be blown away. I mean, she deserves credit for discovering, you know, a whole mess of movie stars, you know. Yeah. yeah. She put them on the map 100%. Uh, anyway, this was early in my career, and I, she had cast me in the Scott Pilgrim movie and The Office at that point. So oh, okay. she had just been bringing me in for everything. And this one, I read for the role of Dan Bacadal's uh, assistant, I mean, uh, Congressman Furlong's yeah. aide or whatever. Mm -hmm. A very short audition, um, and I got that job, and it was a one episode job, and this was season. It was the it was the the last episode of the first season, mm -hmm. and so it was this glorious thing where I got there three days early, and we had rehearsal days. Mm -hmm. the show. I don't know how long that lasted, but it was like it was the first time I'd had that on any job, mm -hmm. much less. Uh, and during the rehearsal, uh, you know, the scene was that Dan. Or uh, for a long would he would toss one of his highly insulting, insulting cruel, like vulgar, offen like offensive, super offensive and yeah. and insensitive demeaning, comments, demeaning for sure. <laughs> yeah, he would toss it to me so that he wouldn't have to be the one to say it, and uh, and that got a laugh or whatever. And and he took me aside in the rehearsal day, and he's like, "This is the funniest part of this bit. I'm going to toss you like three more of my hor oh, horrifying." That's, awesome. that's just the kind. And I was uh, like, "Are you sure that's cool? Are, are you are you want to give up your jokes?" And he's yeah. like, "It's way funnier this way." And it played so well in the room that I, I mean, that's it. We were on the show until the last fucking episode. It was crazy. And that's because I think it's because of Dan just being a generous, you know, as a scene partner. There, generally, there was a spirit of that generosity. That happened yeah. to other castmates. Like, we would always throw, like, I shouldn't, you take, you yeah. know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So Armando helped create that sort of yeah. land. But Dan is a very, very kind dude, that's oh, yeah. for sure. Fair. And I, I want to just ask, you grew up in show business. Your dad was a screenwriter. Did you always know you wanted to be an actor, or was your dad like, "Don't do this, kid"? Like, <laughs> yeah, I got to tell you, no way. I I saw my dad suffering the whole time. But, yeah. By the way, my dad was very successful. He as a writer, and he, uh, you know, he wrote a, a ton of movies. That was his main thing. He's never really done TV. It was all movies, and uh, and he would he made a great living. Sometimes those movies would never be made. Sometimes mm -hmm. he would sell a script and end up on a shelf. Sometimes sometimes he would write a script and the director would change it so much that he took his name off the movie by the time it came out. You know, wow. <laughs> just a a lot of 
the sort of pattern was he made a really good living but was frustrated at all times yeah. when yeah. it was happening. <laughs> and I said, I never want to do this. When I grow up, I don't want to, uh, I would rather just have like a, like a guaranteed paycheck at the end of each week so I could live in peace, you know what I mean? And not this nightmare. And uh, this is really true. I've told this story before, but when I was in high school, I tried to get an in whatever elective I tried to choose freshman year was full. And they, they put me into the only open class, which was the drama class, the drama elective. And mm -hmm. I came home from school. I was very upset. And I said, dad, you got to call the school. Tell them to get me out of this fucking class. I can't do this. I only had like two friends and I had like a 4.0 GPA. I was playing Ultima online. I was that guy. Yeah. And um, I said, there's no way I got to. Also, the, the class had no boys in it. It was only girls. It was uh. drama class. And my dad said to me, he's like, I think you should take this class for at least a month before you decide you want to bail on this. It'll be good for you as like a person. And I was like really upset about it. And I fucking loved it. Yeah. Just uh, a big accident. I got to talk to girls for the first time. I was, I felt that I was good at it. Yeah. I felt that I was funny. I was getting attention that I'd never had before. So yeah, it was a total fluke. And then, and then I was a high school drama nerd or whatever. And I oh, did. wow. You, you committed in high school then. You were all over it. Yeah. I did all the plays. Awesome. I did all that. I played John Proctor in the Crucible. <laughs> wow. <laughs> nice. Uh, senior year. And then, yeah. And, and, and then, you know, wildly enough, my dad encouraged me to go to acting school for, for college, which wow. I did do. I mean, what a psycho thing to, to tell you. A bit, you know, I guess he believed in me, which was fantastic. Or maybe he was just trying to do the reverse psychology. Oh, yeah, sure. Like if I'm telling him not to, that's just going to push him right. toward it more. <laughs> maybe this is like this is the only chance to save him is to yeah, man, <laughs> is to tell him that he it's has not a, full support. It's not and a bad. He was theory. hoping Nelson would say no. Now I don't want to go, Dad. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you're old. Do you think that's cool for you to go to the? Uh, <laughs> he probably saw your passion and your joy, and he's like, do it, whatever. Exactly. You can always change your career after college. Right. Yeah. So I had a lot of support from my parents. My mom was always scared for me, you yeah. Know, yeah, constantly that I would, you know, with good cause too. You know, it's a, it's a crazy line of work to get into, but yeah. I, you know, I appreciate them encouraging me, and that's what it was. Did know. you ever do any like groundlings or any of that kind of training before? Yeah, or you know, out of college, I went to NYU. Uh, I went to Tisch Acting School, which okay. is like sense of whatever. But uh, so I was in New York right around. I went. I graduated from high school in '03, so I got there in '04. Okay, and I just missed the boat. That was like a, the premium time to be doing UCB in New York. Oh I, yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah, we. Uh, yeah, and Zach was in my year at NYU. Zach Woods. Wow. Uh, he was not an acting student. He just was a regular college student who was obsessed with UCB with yeah. constantly. What do uh, you wait? What do you go to NYU for if not for? <laughs> yeah, for performing. What do they? Yeah, what do they do otherwise? They got a medical school there. That's I don't know what the how reputable it is. They have a they have a school of business there. That you can do all the shit there that you would do. Yeah. anything. you can get any degree that you. I, I'm, I don't want to slight the university, and I definitely don't want to turn off any advertisers. Mm -hmm. But if I'm like on the table. And the and the doctors like oh yeah we did used to do this at NYU I'd be like taking the smock off and be like I'm out <laughs> you know what I mean like yeah. I'm not getting I'm not getting cut open by an NYU doctor an NYU doctor yeah these guys former are, actor yeah, current former doctor actor, yeah. current doctor get the fuck out of here <laughs> it changed it didn't work out so I went back to med school it was a lot easier actually than the acting program yeah they wiped their hands off on rats instead of because uh, it's New York well there's experimental uh, that's a good theater joke. too that's a real good that's gonna be like that's gonna play real art right into the heart of the New York. <laughs> listeners who love that stuff your city's disgusting <laughs> i no, i miss new york all the time i, I love it so much oh my god i love new that york. was part of the reason i wanted it i was like look if i can go live in manhattan for free i'll do that I, it, it was and then also yes it's a very high quality acting school there yeah but, yeah, yeah. but i really want to just live in new york there, so. speaking of which out on all the straight on all the picket lines i've been on i haven't seen scabby the rat yet Oh shit! No, the big, are we like, too classy big, for that? I mean, I know uh, we're no, we're dev, we're doing fucking karaoke and, right. Bo and Boba Fett days. Like I'm pretty sure we're not too classy. For <laughs> Every day is around. Boba Fett day. With Every that day one is guy. fucking Boba Fett day. <laughs> Last time I saw you out there was Janet Jackson day on Tuesday. Really? You know they were blasting. <laughs> We got to we got to we got to talk about the theme days. We got to talk about the theme days. <laughs> well, one theory is. Have it old people strike from like nine to ten, where you just take it oh. easy on the music and the bullhorns and the honking and the honking, yeah. <laughs> and then after that, young people can show up. All right, no, that's actually not a bad idea. Yeah, they hold up signs that say "Wave to us" or whatever. Yeah, no thumbs up, no honking. Yeah, right. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Donate to the fund for the people who need it. I don't Give know. Give us nonfiction book recommendations. Um, well, before you read the summary, before go we ahead. go into the episode, I'm, I'm going to start asking this question 
every episode. And we asked it with Norm Ornstein, another spoiler coming up. We're going to have an episode just with Norm Ornstein, which is really fun. Uh, and I think this came from one of the subreddits, which is Nelson Franken. Uh, how many members of Congress do you think you could beat up? <laughs> Oh my God. This is going to be the regular this is question. Be a repeating quiz of a repeating I mean, question. look, the God's truth is that there are so few of them, like under 60, you know? I mean, there's just that, right? I mean, okay, hold on. Well, We're maybe talking... Senate. Oh, 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 sorry. Congress. You said Congressman. I'm sorry. Well, yeah, Congressman. It's yeah. Congressman. both sides. Still a lot. Still yeah, yeah, a lot yeah. of old people there. And so we got like 434. <sighs> look, senators are technically congressmen, too, aren't they? Or they no? are. So I guess how many member? how many members of the House? Hundred you know in the what? Senate. All of them. This is, yeah, yeah there. Hundred in the idea. Senate. 400. Even the Supreme Court. We'll throw in there. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, like too, too easy. Well, then who's going to judge the fight? <laughs> yeah. All oh, right. Okay. We have the separation of keep powers it in the Congress. Okay. Yeah. Look, I'm not winning any of these fights. If I had yeah. been in, if I if I had been in even one fight in my entire life, maybe I could say something. But this is just a hundred percent speculation. These are yes. all, these are all adults who could probably fight back. I don't yeah. know. You could beat a couple of them at yeah. least. Well, the well, old look, ones. Yeah, I, I am six five, like two twenty. So yes, I could just throw my body at some of these guys. And you just got to get them on the floor. Right. Exactly. Right. Once you get them on the floor, you could just lay on them. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This I there. This is not a body shaming question. Mm. You're you're six five two. 20 when trump got arrested and indicted or whatever he's 215 he's skinnier he than he was, nelson he was yeah 63 215 63 63 215 uh-huh. he probably and is 63 he probably is 63 that one he but didn't he's lie not about. 215 no. pounds and the reason i'm bringing this up is mm. because that actually did fuck with the betting lines yeah like 278.5 was, was 78.5 was, was the, the over under over oh. yeah and he like they let himself report and so he was like 215. So if you hit the under, wow. you know, that's a sham. Yeah. That's a sham. Yeah, yeah. That just reminds me of when the naval doctor said he's the greatest specimen of human Dude. flesh I've ever like <laughs> looked at, whatever he said, yes. like the glowing review of his health. Like nobody says he's the most fit man on the planet. Oh my God, that's right. There was that one doctor right. who looked exact. the first time I ever got a medical marijuana card <laughs> was out in Venice, like on the, on the boardwalk. And they were like, all right, the doctor will see you now. And I went into the room and he was asleep and he had headphones on. <laughs> and he was like listening to Simon and Garfunkel and he looked just like that doctor. Do you remember this picture? The guy with the with the shoulder length white hair? I yes. remember the long hair, yeah. Yes. Okay. So, uh, yeah, that was the guy. And anyway. A lot of those doctors had NYU degrees on yeah. the Oh, they... <laughs> the, the, the marijuana. That was the days when you had to go to a doctor and create... Yeah, you know, check off back pain, yep. nausea, yeah. insomnia, anxiety, right? Knee pain. Uh, the, when I went the first I said time, knee pain. That was yeah. My yeah. When, the first time I went to one of those, it was a woman who was a female version of that, like silver haired, <laughs> tall, and she had a lot of like plastic surgery happening. Mm -hmm. And she's like, "Sure." And she's like, "Would you like some Botox too?" And she was Come looking on. at. I'm not kidding, and it made me feel old. But I'm also like, just write the just. No. Do you right. want some Moxie content? Yeah. Too? Like That's you... basically, I got, a, I got a thing here. I can write up anything you need. Yeah, if you like feeling high on weed, you probably also like feeling Botox <laughs> shot into your face. Well, I think she's saying, like, I can do that and you'd, you'd look better. I'm like, just. So you're saying zero members of Congress? No. Okay. Look, I'll, I'll the elderly ones for sure. Okay. <laughs> Let's just put it there. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and just know at home that I am bad at fighting. So that's all. Okay. I, mean. I can't claim. You know, if I felt like I was a good fighter, I'd say, like, all of them, fuck those guys. But okay. I truly don't know. All right. Mm -hmm. So this episode uh, called Thanksgiving aired May 22nd, 2016. Okay. All right, here's the summary from veep.fandom.com. On Thanksgiving Day, Selena is forced to go into hiding. A congressional race in New Hampshire could give Selena the presidency. That's it. That's what? it. That's <laughs> Walsh somehow <laughs> finds the worst summary. It's not hard. Yeah. It's also Always forced. Like this was, I mean, like she's getting like a debagging. Yeah. Did you yeah. lose your wallet? No, I lost my pen. I like to make notes when I think of them. There it is. Oh, you got it. Anyways, <laughs> these are always terrible, and sometimes they're often wrong because, like, no, that's not quite true. Where but are you getting them? Ran anywhere, anywhere yeah. you go, they're all like Wikipedia, Veep Fandom, whatever. I hope they don't want to be a sponsor at this point, but they're always like <laughs> sloppy and sort of phoned in, mm. which just amazes me because isn't there an editor at every one of these shops going like, well, we could just put a little work into this. I really don't think that that's the guy. I think you're vastly overstating the It's just open right source behind. and anybody who wants to write it. open source completely. Okay. It's like the same like people who are filling out the net worth website yes <laughs> <laughs> will is a punching bag 
for Congressman Furlong. Mm-hmm. And you're probably his aide. Is it, was there ever a title or just always his aide? I think aide was yeah. what I again. Yeah. And you're from Ohio. He's the congressman from Ohio. Well, and he ran for governor and failed, right? Yeah, that's right. That's kind of how we met him. And he's loyal to Selena. Yeah. And uh, we've met your wife at this point. Yeah. Who's Jill. been insulted yeah. oh, by God. <laughs> Congressman Jill Donnell. Is that her name, Jill? Uh, it's Jill. I thought it was an O name, like an Irish name. Yeah, it is. A, I was going to say Donnelly, but yeah, maybe yeah. it's O'Donnell. Something like She's that. She's great. O, o, O'Brien or something. Oh, Jill O'Brien, maybe? No, that's the that's the congressman. Yeah. That's, well, no, the, that's the person running. running against Selena. Oh, shit. That's right. It could be Jill Donnelly, but we could, we could or we could look it up at some point. Yeah, we yeah, could. Exactly. Yeah. She's a lovely person. But I mean, she's your wife. You should feel I a should. little... <laughs> We got to work together for like 50 minutes in the seven seasons that we Like did when do. you see other actors, do you just see them as a hurdle and an impediment to what you want to, <laughs> to do? To your fame? To your... Yeah. Blocking yeah. the camera between you and the I camera? I remember that horrible woman took several reaction shots away from me. <laughs> yes. Uh, no, no. She's a lovely person. She is. Uh, I love thinking back to will's confidence when you first Mm. see him with dan like he's kind of like a mover and a shaker he's like uh, he's a different person when you're not seeing him with furlong yeah you know what i mean like and also in in mother you you have that on the steps like when when he's protesting on the steps and he's just like i'm just happy to be here like yeah so stoked like he's a completely different person when he's not around furlong yeah and it, it's like he's trying to be a part of politics. He's trying to be in that world. And this is, I don't know why he sort of tethered his boat to this guy, but like, I think he just likes being a part of, of politics, of the mm-hmm. scene or whatever, even though he's getting shit on. And let me bit. jump forward to the finale of the series. Mm-hmm. What was your flash for? Are you just with Furlong still? So I'm I'm in like a Teddy Roosevelt style <laughs> wheelchair with like a blanket over my legs. And he's pushing and, you, and he's, the, and he's pushing and you. And he's pushing. He's now my caretaker. Yeah, uh, it's like a love affair almost. It like is. It's, it implies that they love each other. Many right? many yeah. people said to me, "Oh, so you guys were lovers that whole time?" It makes a lot of sense now well, after they saw that. But they jumped to that conclusion very quickly. But you were yeah. never playing that. No, up to that moment. No, no, no of yeah. course not. Yeah, yeah. Did what was it was the bit there? I haven't watched rewatched the finale. Was it that like you actually like kind of like he does like a what's that will and you just kind of like slur one out yep. and he then makes it up? I say I I don't take the prompt properly. He said he like sets me up for some line and I oh, say yeah. I said like I like cum or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Apropos of nothing. And then and then Dana some line, eh, well, you know, I don't know, like <laughs> But I'm happy and smiling when I, I'm like the dementia is set in. That's what but you had enough wherewithal to know that you were expected to spo- respond. Yeah, time to say something. Yeah. yeah, the old setup, knock it down. Oh, God, it's so sad. So right off the bat, it's like the, the, she's pardoning the turkeys. Yes. She's acting presidential this season because that's what her team t- tells her to do. Like, yeah. get out there in front. Yeah. What you can do that he O'Brien can't do is act like a president. So she's yeah. doing all the ceremonial stuff. Pardoning turkeys, you know, doing pr- photos with Olympians, like she's doing the cliche moments to remind the public that I'm your re- residing president. There are two things that stick out, one in the world of the show and one outside of it, is that I feel like to name the turkeys drumstick and cranberry is like naming your children college tuition and I, I, I don't know. Nights of lost sleep. Yeah. I don't think the turkey would appreciate those names, no. is I think of what I'm saying. Yeah, of course. Are you saying the writers could have done a better job there? I'm always saying the writers right, could good. have done a better job. It's good when a podcast is critical of the show of, some, yeah, sometimes. Of, of your coworkers and friends. No, just sometimes, yeah. so you're not in the tank on but everything. Also, in this scene, and this has to do with more with comedy writing, I feel like 90% of comedy writing is knowing that a food turkey would collapse under its own weight within a year. Oh, yeah. God, and yeah. then just being like, oh my God, we're in a scene that has turkeys. Yeah they will collapse under their weight, which leads to like a great kind of funny moment with you of, okay, do you have like a fun Fun way that I can say that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Well, I I agree with you. Like I've never really been employed by a writer's room. I wrote a sketch show back in the day, but that's about it. But it seems like the real things always stick, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That was what I learned in a writer's room. Uh, Dave would talk about that when he was working. He told me stories about when he was working on Seinfeld, when they were meeting new writers, like part of the process was like, like, you know, coming up with three or four different storylines. He he would talk about how like 
he would hear the five and he'd be like, that one's the real one. And, and he was mo more often than not right. And it was because it the, was the one that jumped out yeah. the most. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting process. Um, you didn't sound very interested. <laughs> Well, I was aware of like we've hammered this point a couple times. I guess you're right. So I had multi I had multiple levels of thought in that moment. Okay. <laughs> so we're not only being critical of the other writers and of the actors and performers, but we're also being critical of our guest hosts, of our of our co-hosts and myself because I participated in okay. the prolonging of this moment. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> True. Help True. us, Nelson. Say something interesting. That was I noticed in that scene. Um, Catherine was videotaping. This is, is she's. This is the season where she's making her documentary. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I almost forgot about that whole thing. And that's just the one tiny moment you see her in that episode too. Is Which is actual yeah. filming cam uh, yeah. footage. Yeah yeah. 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 Which I thought was really smart. Uh, I love the Clea conversation that comes. Oh, yeah. Like Clea with like her deadpan, like straight ahead, like forthrightness. Like she has the basically the exact same lines two times in this episode. It bookends the show, yeah. It bookends yeah. the show, and it's great both times. Where are you from, Marjorie? Maryland. Oh, I'm from there, too. I, I know, know ma'am. <laughs> and then at the end, their reaction to it, like, what the, what the <laughs> fuck was that? Yeah. 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 But also, if you do take into account, this was something I didn't notice uh, the first time, if you take into account the timing that by this point, she has started dating Catherine. Mm. And so now, like, inherently, there is going to be, like, an emo... She is now emotionally involved with the president's narcissism. Do you think the actors, Clea and Sarah, knew... You, there was no there was no interaction, but like she I think Clea was at the turkey pardoning and, and Sarah was in the background, but there was no scene between them. Mm -mm. I bet they didn't even know yet. I think they, or do you think, think they, they told them they in the, the seasonal arc? Oh, I think that I think so. That, they were looking for moments, probably. I'm not even sure if they were looking for it. I just think that there is some magic there in that that scene, play, like their reaction to it of like what the fuck is that plays without that, and maybe like it, there's like a little bit of magic in the fact that it also plays really well if you yeah. consider that that is Marjorie like letting a little bit of her feelings yeah. Yeah. through. And yeah. I should, you know, I'd like to see that scene again because I wonder if, you know, Catherine is turned on by the fact that, that Marjorie's kind of rolling her eyes at the president like, oh, somebody else gets me. You yeah. Know? Yeah, or she's safe because that's very dangerous for a Secret Service yeah. person to do. Yeah. Yeah. But she feels safe with Catherine, which uh, I guess that makes sense. I was going to talk, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say there's another, uh, there's like another uh, joke in this that I didn't I just think stands alone as a funny joke where Gary where uh, Selena says like I thought uh, I thought Doyle was gonna shit the bed uh, but he's like doing turn down service and leaving a mint on my pillow and Gary's like you know that can be the difference between a three and four star hotel that's just like a great joke but I never noticed that it was related to Gary somehow having a bachelor's in hotel management yes yeah. Yeah. like I had not I had not put those two things together the first time I saw it's it it's because every line is a joke you, how could you possibly yeah. you know it's crazy they're up against the clock at all times in that. that's the only show I know where they'll, they run the show all the way through the entire credits rolling there's just that still show still going, yeah, but do you have any good Baltimore memories? I loved it. I mean, you know, it, in a weird sort of turn of events, it, it helped me with my fear of flying. Oh, really? Oh. I've never. It's never been so bad that I like don't get on the plane. But I've just never enjoyed it really. And Veep was so disorganized that they would. They <laughs> How would, dare you? They would give me like two hours notice. Like, you, there's a car coming to your home right now. <laughs> Pack your bag right now. And I'd be like, I don't have time to get anxious about this flight. I didn't book it a month in advance, you know? Yeah. Nelson, we need you to get to Baltimore. I'm already here. Oh, <laughs> shit. Never mind. <laughs> Did you? I was listening to the Brian Husky episode. Did he ever talk about that time where he had to go back? Yeah. But um, one time I was already up there with Dan and uh, Brian was like, oh, yeah, I'm flying up this evening. I'm getting on the plane and this afternoon. I said, great. In between the time his plane took off and landed, they cut him out of the episode. So he like lands <laughs> and they're like, hey, listen, you can either get on the next flight back or of course we're going to pay you. And of course we'll put you up. You can stay the night. We'll put you on the next flight tomorrow. So we, me and him and like Pasquazi went out to dinner and stuff. And he was like, I don't know. I mean, I'm still making my weekly fee or whatever. So what can I say? Oh my God. But, it, 
Doesn't surprise me. I guess I didn't <laughs> yeah. know that one. No, no, I tell I that story all the time. <laughs> he didn't tell that story. I well, guess, there, really. I think Backall has one where he reminded them that he, that he was at the Four Seasons. Oh, he, really? Like, I think they parked him at the Four Seasons, and like three, four, five days later, he called Stephanie or somebody, Dale, and it's like, guys, am I worth? And they're like, oh shit, no, we don't need you, or or oh, yes, dude, no. oh my, like God. it was that kind of. Here's yeah. the deal: like it was like that in the Armando regime, and then also in the yeah. game, it never changed. <laughs> That was like the through line of the show, you know. I, I will. That's and some, Dave will admit that. And Dave yeah, will admit yeah. that. I yeah. think it was it's in I the mean, DNA. I, I've said that before. Yeah, it's just the DNA of the show. It's like there's no and every in between every year they'd be like, oh, we figured it out. It's not going to happen. Right. So yeah. yeah. Fucking right back to it. Yeah. And that's why I was always so in awe of Dan back at all. We would get our scripts like at two in the morning the night before we had to work. So Dan would be in the makeup chair at six in the morning, looking at his sides for the first time. Uh, <laughs> and he's like, fuck, I got two pages. This is in 90 minutes from now. You know? And he would always do it. He always did it. Yeah. It's fucking crazy. You two are sort of the symbiotic version of Selena and Gary, by the way. Oh. It's like, oh, uh, yeah. yeah. It's a similar two, right. you know, two man show there. They touched Anyways. on that in my first episode where Gary and I like looked at each oh, other. Oh, yeah. Sort of uh, frustratingly. Yeah. Oh, well, then that, that might be a little bit of a segue into the Dan storyline in this uh. one. Of him sort of turning yeah. into him turning into Gary. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So Dan is assigned to be part of the Tom James thing because he's back from Nevada. The, yeah. the recount is over. And one of the things we talk about a lot is like Mike's bad at his job. But <laughs> what we're also agreeing on is everyone's bad at their job. And Dan, once again, proves he's bad at his job. He's bad at his job. I think after he has sex with, with Anna's sister, sister yeah. Yeah. in the show. Uh, he has a line is like, I'm just, I'm not having a great year. Yeah. And this, this episode definitely continues that. Yes. Like he even makes an attempt and frankly, a great a attempt to, to get back to like use the juice that would always go so well. And Hugh Laurie mm. is so a, cold, so scene. fucking yeah. cold. What a goddamn snake. Yeah, mm -hmm. Dan plays his ace, thinks yep. he's got it, a way in, I'll do whatever you need, and Tom just ices him. And then so, reminds him that he went crazy, uses yeah. his history against mm -hmm. him. Yes. We're talking about your mental health, Dan. Yeah, we're talking about <laughs> your mental health. Jesus. Yeah, he's so wicked. Yeah. This might be the first time that we've seen the actual snake of tom james mm -hmm. you know what i mean like the actual kind of dastardly version of him and not the the ugly not the ugly yeah not the ugly version. no you're right because we talk about tom, like because he's so affable when dan meets him he's like all right raise your hand i'm kidding yeah. Like, yeah. he's so likable and dan's like oh this is going to be a great job and then he has this other side of him that he can drop in a second yeah but you're right this is like the first time we see how mean tom can be mm -hmm. and our, our show is not one for and I'm not going to say, like, this is not meant to be uh, a criticism of the visuals. It was meant to be haphazard. But there was a, a shot in that scene when Dan first goes into Tom James's office where they play the thing about Sidney Purcell where, where, Tom, where Tom is like, oh, Putting his phone down? Yeah. Uh, how did I, how did, how did they, how do you even get this number? They play that whole scene from out in the hallway looking in. And I thought that was like a really good choice of shot to put there because they're burying it as far in the background as yes. they can. Yeah. And I just really liked that choice. And I think our show is is so chaotic in the way that it's shot that there aren't a lot of opportunities to let the to let the framing tell the story. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. That's Chris Addison right there. I looked it up who directed this episode. Oh yeah, we should have we should have said who directed it. Chris Addison. Wait, Wait did who? you say this? No, no, I'm just repeating it. Why are you wearing a flannel on the hottest day of the year? Well, it's not a flannel. I think it's shanty. Oh, is it? Okay. Uh, I don't know. It's like chamay, sham no, a chamois. <laughs> chamois. In Maine, we call them chamois shirts. A chamois, like yeah, what well, you talking about? Like a shamwow, like cotton. A yeah. Huh? Is chamois cotton? I'm not sure. Mm. Okay. Well, ask my mom what a chamois shirt is <laughs> because right. she'd be like, "Wear your chamois shirt." Oh my god. All right. So it looks like a flannel. I take it back. So Dan uh, tries to play his ace. It doesn't work, and because he has no loyalty to anyone, immediately turns around and tries to play it against Tom yeah. with. Kent and Ben 
And <laughs> Ben makes fun of him for going crazy. Favorite, it's crazy. my favorite joke in the whole episode. Sorry, go Keanu. No, 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 do it. So Ben is doing, in, in retrospect, a very Trumpy type of thing where yes. he's like sort of doing that yes. thing. Uh, he's making fun of his panic attack, and but that wasn't my favorite part. So he's like, he keeps making fun of Dan's panic attack, and Dan's like, "Come on!" It was just a little, and he just interrupts him. Blah, 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 blah. But the best part, <laughs> yeah, the, the camera, that's a good impression. Of <laughs> yeah, I've been doing. They never pan away. They never cut away from Kevin. But then after Dan has left the room, you just hear Gary Kent. Cole. Well done. Well done. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and I laughed. I like spit my drink out. Yeah. They don't even have to show them. Don't even show them. No. It's just like, you know. Uh, well done. Funnier that way. <laughs> that one, that Ben or, or Kevin moment makes, there were these days where every once in a while Kevin would just be in a bad mood. Oh. And well, not like bad mood, bad mood, but like sometimes, it, you know, like these delays or like, sure. you know, do you even know that I'm in my hotel room right, right now? Right, right. Sometimes like uh, one time, I think I've mentioned it before, Kevin was in rehearsal for like a big scene, but he didn't have any lines and they weren't like giving him anything to do. So he just started pretending to vacuum. Yeah. <laughs> and he would just like, he would just run his vacuum in between Julia and Tony. <laughs> like, <laughs> and so, uh, so fuck I, you. I feel like this is a, I don't, I, I, I almost guarantee you that that, Ben stuff wasn't scripted. It like is a great joke that comes from Kevin being like a little upset, but not too upset. Mm. And he's just like, you know what? Today I'm gonna fuck with this. <laughs> yeah, like that story. I'm, I know I've told it before. The story of him on the set of Luck, when uh, when David Milch kept giving him like different numbers in the pilot. It was like, okay, now. Like uh, now it's gonna be uh, horse number seven in race five, and like, you know, it was like, all these fucking different numbers of horse races, and he's in like this little motorized scooter, <laughs> and at one point he was like, Milch, give me your give me, give me another fucking one of these numbers, I'm gonna go crazy, and Milch comes in, does it again, <laughs> and Kevin in his little motorized chair in the middle of a take starts pretending that the motorized <laughs> chair is going crazy, <laughs> he's like, oh, oh no, and like scoots off set and uh, like through the frame. <laughs> <laughs> Man, that's good. Uh, so, like, he has yeah. a way of, like, he, he's never going to be, like, I'm just not coming out of my trailer. He's like, no, I'll go do your fucking scene. Yeah, but I'm going to fucking, I'm going to, I'm going to fucking have this moment where he's like, ah, ah. It's great. He's a strong individual. God, I fucking 100%, love it. I love 100%. It. it. So, the, congressionally speaking, or mm -hmm. constitutionally speaking, Selena now, as, at the end of uh, the funeral scene in the previous episode, she... Tom says, on to the house, ma'am. So yes. now she has to call the congressman and one by one win their favor and make sure she's getting their support. So yes. that's going on. That's how we meet Seth Morris as Congressman mm -hmm. Yeager, who's so funny. Uh, doing not so great because they are <laughs> he and his wife are working through some things. Yeah. And then she yeah. goes, hookers or whatever. She yeah. Yeah. yeah, hookers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, oh, that is so. That is also the cover for why she can't go join Catherine at the at the vacation house. Yes, yeah, she has to make calls. Like you know, oh, mm -hmm. it's my house. I can't get used to saying, saying that. that. And Catherine the, got all the wealth. From yeah, Mima. I, there's that great joke in there. This is the first Thanksgiving without Mima, Ugh. and Selena's like, yeah, there's a lot to be thankful for. <laughs> <laughs> so that that the cover for her staying in town to get this debagging yeah. is that she has to call all these congressmen, which she does, which she could do. Yeah. She makes the excuse of, of people want to see the White And they House have seeded number. the debagging through previous episodes this year. She has been a little obsessed with her right. eye bags in earlier episodes. So she's doing that, and uh, Catherine has Mimo's house. And then mm -hmm. oh, yeah. <laughs> Jonah is coming in with his mom. Yep. And we're right now, who is Jonah working for? Uh, he What's his job? He was, he's come back from Nevada. Come back from Nevada. He's still just... A, he's, he's working for Sam, right, uh, Richard? I think, well, at this point, at this point, it is... We're actually not sure, because okay. he was under Richard and Amy and Dan's purview. For the Nevada recount. For the Nevada stuff. But the okay. first time we see him, it's just them together, and he's showing them around. Oh, this blue pass, green pass thing yes. was taken from in the world of... The pilot. Uh, of the pilot of... Oh. Uh, of I have a White House badge, I have uh, West Exec parking, all of those, all of those little status moves that really mean something to those people. Yeah, um, and that that can give you access. Oh, this is a story that I wanted to bring up. So, at one of the correspondence dinners, 
and went on a White House tour. And uh, it was really fun. It was like, I think it were like three people, three or four people there. It was, it was small. Mm -hmm. We all had different badges that had our security clearances on them because there were people who were not uh, American citizens. And so if you were like, and you, have, you had like a C, like a yellow C badge or something like that, that meant you weren't an American citizen. So there were places you just couldn't go. Interesting. So the guy giving the tour said at one point, I think I asked him, I, he was like, he showed us the White House mess. He showed us like the, you know, the White House mess. And that was interesting. You know, it really just looks like a, you know, kind of boring, Dinner Viet, place, yeah. you know, you know, whatever white bankers cable, club or bankers whatever. club yeah, exactly. whatever it's all that leather bound room uh, yes yeah. and uh and and while we were walking around i asked where the situation room was and he was like actually it's like right through that door but like you know we we really don't bring people in there for a lot of tours he was like you know maybe if like you know you know one time like ben affleck came through and we like you know gave him a tour <laughs> but it was also like yeah man i know I'm not fucking Ben Affleck, but you don't have to like just tell me like yeah like if important me if actual real important stars come through, we'll do that. Jeez. But right after that happens, a guy comes out of the of the Situation Room office, sees us, recognizes everybody that's there, and goes, "Oh hey, do you guys want to see the Situation Room?" <laughs> and so then we are brought in. And we are shown around for about four minutes before one of them's like, oh, you have a C badge. You oh, you shouldn't be in here at all. Like it's not only is it not something that it's in, is that important. It's so not important that they don't even consider the national security implications. Yeah, of it. it's a gray area, isn't it? It depends yes. on who's working. Yeah, just <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Get into the situation room. But so I did actually get in to see like the real ass situation room. Wow, and that was pretty cool. I think it's because somebody more famous than you was in your group. Oh, a hundred. Okay. No, no, no. I'm not even gonna. Yeah, I'm you don't not have even to gonna, say who it was. I yeah. mean, it was pretty impressive. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. Tell us afterwards. I'll tell you afterwards. Okay. So um, I'm showing him the White House mess, and Dan's not supposed to be in there. Yeah. And then you and Dan have a little tete a tete. Yeah, I'm a little And he jerk. says, I'm have a, a nice. Jerk. He calls you, he insults you, and then says, lovely to meet you. And yeah, yeah, yeah. To your mother, yeah. I hope you ch <laughs> die choking on a glistening dog dick. Yes. And then it's like, lovely to meet you, Miss Ryan. And then uh, she invites uh, Richard to Thanksgiving, mm -hmm. and Jonah throws a mini tantrum, and then. Follows it up. Ultimate. Would yeah, you course. like to come to Would Thanksgiving? Like to come to Thanksgiving? <laughs> that was very funny. Now that I have a two-year-old, that behavior is very familiar to me. No, I'm going to do. I'll do it. <laughs> I, I do it. Yeah, I do. I do. I do. I do. Yeah. This was post. There's a, a joke in here about North Korea, uh -huh. right? And I uh, a fat joke. A fat joke. But yeah. they say glorious leader because this was post uh, this was post the interview right mm -hmm. there were really were not a lot of network notes from what i understand mm -hmm. but i'm sure that one of them has to be do not mention this guy by name yeah all oh, right nothing ever happened after the interview came out. i know he was they were issued a statement like this is a grave problem for the united mm -hmm. states now and then just nothing that was just bullshit right well they did release every the single sony email sony dump. email they did that they did that yeah oh shit i can't believe i forgot about that yeah wow i remember seeing on twitter one time somebody making the joke that said all I want is to someday make a movie that has a Wikipedia section called The Aftermath. <laughs> uh, yeah. And Seth Rogen replied and just said, no, you don't. <laughs> I, thought that, I thought that was great. Oh, boy. This, that, uh, Gary has that funny line about, like, oh, it's going to take 10 years off your eyes. And, like, oh, then you look a like baby. a baby. Like, <laughs> and the rivalry between him and Dr. Abernathy. We've seen this character before, and it's instantly, like, this... I know more than you do kind of stuff. I wrote a guy that I wanted to shout out. Which yeah. Is Phil Reeves is Phil Reeves. And Andrew Doyle. You know, Parks and Rec is my favorite like sitcom. It's like yeah. my favorite show. And he is so fucking Not good on that. But it's, really? Well, huh. But go ahead. Let's say I just want to throw out. No, we shouldn't take it. No, no, no. Go ahead. You no. sound hurt. Oh, I'm not saying I'm hurt. I'm just okay. saying in the in the spirit of talking things out, uh -huh. you were <clears throat> commenting off mic about how useful therapy is. For communication's sake, mm -hmm. let's just say, hypothetically, <laughs> there's a Parks and Rec rewatch podcast. Yeah. And they invited you at 2 p.m. on a Monday, hypothetically, and it conflicted with this. What would you? I would do this one. Oh, wow. Okay. I was never on that show, but I was on this show. Oh, okay. Oh, so there are caveats. To I that. guess so. <laughs> Look, um, <laughs> they're both great shows, but, you know, you got to pick. I don't know. It just was, it's really struck a chord with me. It was 
was it before Veep or simultaneous to Veep? I can't remember. But probably si- they are definitely overlap. Uh, Todd Aaron Bratzi. Oh yeah, Bratzi. Todd Aaron Bratzi. Doctor, doctor Abernathy. Yeah. yeah, he's great. He's Anyways, incredible. go ahead. Your anecdote about Parks and Rec. No, I don't have any. Just that he was great on that show. Phil Reeves, and he's great on this show. And this is also has Jim O'Hare in it. So there's like it's a weird Parks and Rec reunion. Yeah. yeah. Oh wait, well, what? Jim O'Hare. I came out of Chicago. I've known Jim O'Hare since I started doing sketch comedy oh, in really? Chicago. He was in a group called White Noise. <laughs> I was in a group like called Department one. of Works. <laughs> And we used to perform at this club, The Roxy, and Jim's so sweet, and so and I've played poker with Jim through the years, and he's so funny on that show, and it was, of course I never saw him on Veep, like, I don't even think I knew he was on the show until I, it aired, do you uh, know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. it's that big of a show now, like, there's all these people coming in. He had, he has that sort of, like, Chicago character actor vibe. Yeah. Where, like, if you go back and watch movies from the 70s, like, if whatever, if you go back and watch, like, Thief, there will be a guy in there that looks like he's 58 years old. And you're like, you know how old that guy was when he shot that movie? He's 27. Yeah. yeah. And like Jim O'Hare probably looks like looked like a Midwestern yeah. dad, like a Midwestern character guy. He looked that way when he was 25. He looked 25 when he was 25. When he's 75, he's going to look 25. Like yeah. he, It's like he's just never aged. It's awesome. He is. And he's so sweet on Parks and Rec, and in this one, he really gets yeah. mean. Yeah. Oh, you probably want to fuck both my daughters. Yeah, you yeah. want to fuck my wife, You want to fuck my wife now? Yeah, yeah. that's oh, right. Gosh. I also want to uh, shout out um, somebody who we've shouted out before, but uh, so uh, Mary Catherine Garrison, who plays Amy's sister, who's, again, so funny in this episode, as she always is. She has, like, that great exit line of, like, Dan's like, I'm getting out of here, and she's scolding her kids, and she's like, if you don't <laughs> shut up, I'm going to call your father's. <laughs> and she's so like nihilistic and like she's such a chaos agent of a yeah. sister to like the very straight laced Amy. Amy. Yeah. I I'm not because we are in a strike, I'm not going to tell anybody to watch a different show. I'm I not know what gonna, show you're gonna mention. I but, didn't realize. But it was I'm her. not I'm just gonna say look up the work that she does if you feel like it. I have recently started watching it and she's incredible. Mm. Like, I didn't realize it was her because she's so different. And I just, I love seeing the work that she's doing because she's not, she's still playing like this, like a sort of uh, like an antagonistic sister. Yeah. But like at its core, it is a completely different. She's type. much more together in that she's role. Much more yeah, together. Put together, yeah, yeah. And she is an antagonistic sister, but it comes from a completely different angle. She's really fucking good. And she yeah. deserves every bit of credit that she gets. We're she's not awesome. talking about Parks and Rec, but we're not talking about Parks and Rec. So you probably don't so, care. Yeah. It's, oh, man. Sorry to disappoint you, Nelson. I like when Gary says teabagging is my department. <laughs> <laughs> <And> <laughs> she's <laughs> so de- He doesn't know what that fucking means. <laughs> he means that literally. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There is a shot in the background of the of, of a newscaster talking about the Salmonella outbreak. That is Gita Pulapilli, who is another Mainer, and oh. she is a friend of a uh, friend of Allison Jones because Allison Jones has Maine connections. She right. uh, she has family from Northern Maine. Gita doesn't she's not really an actress. It was just Allison being like, "Hey, do you want to you want to play a newscaster?" She ended up coming back a few times. Oh right? wow! Because like you know, once you establish there, and also Ben Harris plays a reporter. Uh, ben Harris for many years was the uh, associate casting director for Allison Jones, and he's one of my closest friends. Yeah, he w- he was in the first scene, I think, or no, whenever your first press conference was in that. Yeah, he said, "What about this? The uh, where's the president or something? I don't know." I love to see. He he makes an appearance on almost all the shows he works on. I yeah. Think. I've never befriended a casting director because whenever I go in a room, I have like just phobia of any interaction with them. I get it. And I think you and I went to happen to sit next to each other at a premiere of some movie and Ben was there. And I've worked with them now, apparently. They probably don't think about me at all, but they must think I'm an <laughs> asshole and arrogant no. person. You know what I mean? Because I literally can't, when I go on an audition, I can't look at anyone. I'm like, hey, and then I leave. It's just one of those places I don't function well, which nobody really does, but that's how right. it manifests. But Ben is someone you said, that I remember at that event, you reintroduced me to him, and of course, I'm like, I don't know if I know him. Oh well, yeah, that was like that was like it you was people. a premiere. It was like yeah, it was you year. people, which he probably recent. cast, right? <laughs> he did, yeah. And I'm like, that's Allison's assistant, oh, no, and maybe. you're like, no, he runs the joint now. And I'm like, ah, I'm terrible. This is why showbiz is sometimes isn't my first thing. <laughs> well, actually, he took a new job during the pandemic. He's no longer. Uh, oh good. Yeah. He oh good. Is the should I be 
talking about this? I don't know. I guess it's just it's not bad. He's the vice president of casting at Netflix for comedy. Whoa. See? It's a huge gig for him. Hey, amazing. that's awesome. I was so proud of him, yeah. And then we went on strike like six months later. Oh, and nice. We were, like walking outside of his building. Don't you. worry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He'll remember you. He won't remember me. I <laughs> he guarantee was, He was the officiant at my wedding with Georgia. Shut up. That's how close we are with him. That's yeah. great. I'll tell you that, I'll be the first person to tell you that I, I don't believe that any person needs to go to acting school to be good at acting. But what it did for me was it removed the stigma of performing in front of a bunch of people that I'm embarrassed to fuck up in front of by way of me fucking up a million times in front of all my professors that I looked up to, the girls I had crushes on or whatever, just fucked up Shakespeare, fucked up Chekhov, whatever you can imagine. <laughs> For 10,000 hours I spent fucking up in front of, so now when I go in one of those that's rooms, the I'm skill like, you own. whatever, dude, I don't care what happens in here now, yeah. So that's, thank you, acting school. I would have benefited from acting school. Maybe yeah. I would be more friendly with uh, casting people. <laughs> you also have a pretty, you have a pretty good philosophy around improvisation in auditions, right? It's a weird, it's a touchy subject because some people encourage you to do it in auditions and some people do not like it and you don't really get the vibe until you're there. But what I always do is, because you're, you're working with a reader who's uh -huh. just reading a piece of paper, they're not an actor usually. Mm -hmm. So I work all my ad libs into the the middle of lines where it's not the end of, of my line the, uh, like the reader's cue line remains the same smart but i will insert things in where it's just i'm in control of yeah. how the joke plays out or whatever you know this is good but, takeaway for any actors listen we give a lot of yeah. good takeaway on this show for mm -hmm. actors they've given a lot of good takeaways on the the parks and rec <laughs> Jim uh, O'Hare. Yeah. Jim O'Hare. Uh, what is it called? Talks and Rec? Is Parks and Recollection. Yeah, oh, Parks and Recollection. Great it name. is a great title. Yeah, insane. It's Jim O'Hare and somebody else. And it's, um, uh, I'm forgetting his name because I'm trying to think of it, but he was, a, he, was a, he was one of the writers, yeah, and he played the he played the sound effect guy to Nick Kroll's shock jock DJ. Oh, funny. He was the guy who would go like, you so horny, whatever. I'm going to look, I'm going to Google this while we're All right. Here. A shout out to Phil Reeves in this first scene uh, where Kevin goes to see him and he, and he says, I'd love to invite you to the table, but my wife fucking hates you, as do I. <laughs> as <Yeah>. do I. <laughs> that's, a, that's like three jokes, maybe. <sighs> and Phil is like one of those guys that just has uh, like a natural gravitas yes. to him. Like he is one of the like you have seen one hundred million politicians that look exactly like Phil Reeves. <laughs> it just happens that Phil Reeves is also a person that's really talented as an actor. Yeah. So he has like that sort of inherent political gravit gravitas, but can really handle a great joke like that. And it's like you fucking people, you treat the Constitution like it's a build your own pizza menu. Yeah. Yes, it's amazing. <laughs> well, he's been so abused by the Meyer administration. He's yeah. been promised things. They keep him out of meetings. Like his whole journey with them is like, I'm so done with you people. <laughs> yeah. So anytime you walk in a room with you know Doyle, he's already angry. Oh, if it's oh right, and then she can't give him Secretary of State later. Yeah. Right. Well, actually, you know she's not going to give it to course. him. She's like, I am a woman of my word, and you have my word. <laughs> Which yeah. What does that mean? That means That's like a perfectly written nonsensical sentence. Right? Yeah. It's not a promise, but he walks away thinking like, oh, okay, I got He's what stuck. I wanted. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So there's also like a really fun thing where they have to come in and when Ben comes in and he's like, ma'am, Doyle's here and you have to be nice yeah. to him. And she's like, so why, are people, <laughs> why are people always telling me I got to be nice to people? Yeah. So the Salmonella thing is breaking. So <laughs> the first thing she says is like, get Tom J James out there. He's a tall drink of Xanax. Yeah. Mm. So he's out there with Dan mm -hmm. sort of smoothing that over and dropping it. In, dropping in all zucchini, the zucchini farm salmon right, things right. that he's yeah. getting from Purcell. And gonna, then, go ahead. Yeah. I was going to say salmon, exactly. Yeah. Okay. And then, uh, while that's happening, it, it, they need an official statement, which is why they're going to Doyle, right? Because mm -hmm. it's escalating. Uh, even though Ken says it's just a statistical anomaly, I wish people understood. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Or and Kevin's like, or how to fucking cook a turkey? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> that writer is Greg Levine, by the way. I just looked at him. Okay, Greg Levine yeah, and Jim right. O'Hare. Yeah. Okay, check out that podcast. Yeah, everybody. Go ahead and hey, check it. You you're know like a secret assassin. You're here to promote that show. When I was googling this, I found out something else. Rachel Axler was a Parks and Rec writer. She was. Oh, I didn't yeah. realize that. I didn't know that until right now. Rachel. Axler honestly has written 
on just about everything that's mm. been good in the last yeah, like very 15 good. years. Like Aww. she's prolific and is a, is a great writer. So it totally we saw her the other day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's yeah, going to be on, on the, the show coming up pretty soon. Oh, oh good. Uh, on the Parks and Rec show? Uh, yeah, on the Parks and Rec show. <laughs> on the crossover. Do you want to you drop their schedule for who they got coming up on Parks and Rec on our uh, website? I'll check the phone. They are prolific. They yeah. have a, And also they have big names. I used to be in a sketch group with Amy Poehler. Maybe we can get some I heard about there. it. Yeah, yeah. I heard that you guys ran a business together. Yeah, we used to run a theater together. Oh, yeah, that's right. I shouldn't have said that was my favorite show. I regret saying that. Yeah, you're never going to live this down. Only if you promise when you go on there to say Veep is your favorite show. Okay, yeah. Yeah. I'm never going to be, they're never going to have me on that, though. They don't care about me over there. Like you you guys care about me. Were you on? I care about you so much. I was never on that show. It's the one, I tested for the Chris Pratt role on that show. Whatever happened to him? Uh, I don't know. I never, you know, I I heard that uh, he became like a hermit, uh, like a carpenter, like a solitary man. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Good for him. Mm Mm-hmm. He did, um, he did a much Not all job. of us are cut out for it. Yeah. 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 I, I just want to say in the Abernathy scene, Gary says, I have a degree in hotel management. She goes, no, you don't. <laughs> yeah. No, you don't. <laughs> no, I you wondered don't. about that. That's so. Oh, man. <laughs> so like, I don't that know. That is like. That's the, brilliant. The narcissism. I just, God damn it. I love it so much where it's like. If I don't know it, it's because it's not true. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I just fucking love and that. Gary doesn't say anything after. No. He's just like, oh. And like later on, when he's like, well, you know, I set a table for two, you know, two place settings. He's like, oh, Charlie's not going to be here. Well, I thought maybe we could just talk. And she's like, I'm not hungry. Yeah. Neither am I. Yeah. Uh, I never realized that. Sherman, that Congressman Sherman dies because of the salmonella outbreak. Right. I, I never really put that together, which is what opens up the spot that Jonah will eventually run for. Right. Mm-hmm. We're getting, yeah, that's right. And I, it's just, uh, we had forgotten about Doyle for a while because he hadn't been around. Yeah, <laughs> so the funny. Doyle like, dazzle. Doyle is still, yeah, the Doyle dazzle. So he wants to finally see her. So he has to go in and see the bags under her eyes in that room and he has that terrible joke about yeah. is ben beating you up oh yeah yeah uh, <laughs> domestic abuse jokes right. oh they're so good they just tickle me <laughs> yes man sherman dies pretty quickly Get gets salmonellies in the hospital he dies that gets in that gets us into uh jeff kane coming to talk to kent and ben about who's gonna run for that seat because that takes away a vote for o'brien mm-hmm. And if they can get a special election done in time, it could possibly add a vote for Meyer. Yes. So they all of a sudden are very interested in that seat. Uh, His widow is going to run in the special election, which Kent references by saying, I have recurring nightmares about running (laughs) against widows. (laughs) And we see our first, we have our first introduction to Jeff Kane. Which is him coming down and, you know, uh, I don't give, you don't give me names, I give you names. So you can take your list, roll it up in a tiny little whatever, attach it to a carrier pigeon and fly it straight up Tubby's dick. <laughs> yeah, that's his first episode? Yeah. That's his first episode, wow. yeah. He hit the ground running, didn't he? Did, he did, yeah. He even got loud with you at one point at the Thanksgiving dinner. He was like... Oh no, he yeah. kept it. He kept under wraps because I he, guess you're right. Like he he almost goes full right. Uncle Jeff there. Like the <laughs> I will put you back in the toy box where you belong. Do you understand? You get trace me. Yeah, the like that little bit of like, do you understand me? In that at that season in that episode later, uh, yeah. or sorry, in that scene later, he almost gets gets to the Uncle Jeff heights. Yeah, the heights. You had a, that's one of my favorite lines. I think this is maybe the only, it's a great joke, but it's maybe the only thing that Jonah's ever said that's like 100% relatable to everyone else, which is Ice Bucket Challenge could suck my dick. <laughs> uh, and then Sam says, hey, that raised a lot of awareness to whatever ALS is. <laughs> so funny. It's so funny. Everybody got it in. I love that. Uh, did you do it? I did. I did yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. I like the line where Ben says, I'm going to put a baby in you if you don't get your head in the game, Mike. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. We <laughs> yeah, had a chicken right. with Mike. There's well, that, that C story about you're getting your uh, the surrogate. Yeah. So we finally got a surrogate who's going to carry the baby. And Wendy likes talking. I forget whatever the comments were. But then Mike realizes that the turkey hotel room is up for grabs so they can have a quickie. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, uh, and that, by the way, we filmed in classic V fashion. We filmed a couple. I think they even filmed them in bed, me and Wendy. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I remember <laughs> one time, I don't think this is terrible. I think Kathy to Jimmy was like, what if like uh, Wendy puts, tries to put a dildo up Mike 
Yeah. And I'm like, yeah. wait a minute, no. Wait, wait, <laughs> wait a minute. In the spirit of improv, she was like pitching ideas, and I'm like, no. I'm like, <laughs> like we do. your imagination of their relationship is quite different than, mine. than the tone of this. Well, the scene. tone of the show. <laughs> And also, it is any ideas welcome, but I was yeah, like, yeah, I yeah. don't think so. I was you know, just like, that's making me realize that, like, obviously, there were no turkeys in the hotel room. Like, did, did they spend taxpayer money on like two hotel rooms every year to put imaginary turkeys in? I bet they do for the ceremony I, of it. Sure. That's like got to be one of those things that they learn. It's about. really for the turkey wranglers, let's be honest. Okay. They yeah, have okay. to sleep somewhere because they came Maybe. from yeah, a farm. Yeah, that's true. Okay. So that's like the Seinfeld thing of like, that's so ridiculous. It's got to be true. Yeah. And it probably is the turkey wranglers, but it just means that. You ask if there's uh, uh, if you can catch Salmon Illich from just fucking in a turkey's bed. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and then I'm like, never. And the guy who's the head of the CDC, I forget his name. He's great. He's yeah, he's very dry and straight. He's sure. wonderful. Meredith Hagner is the woman who. Plays, oh my God! Yes, is the woman that plays the, your surrogate, who's introduced in the the last episode, and who's fucking incredible. Who, she played my daughter in a movie that David Cross directed. Oh really? No yeah. Way. She's great. I met her years ago when we were filming Veep in the middle of one of the seasons. Uh, she played my daughter, and she's great. Yeah, she's awesome. Uh, uh, Jeff Kane said there's only one spectacular dumbass. Uh, they Oh, in the... Oh, God damn, there's this line where he's talking about Ezra and how his wife's a solid eight, probably still be a seven after she has kids. I wrote that down, too. Yeah. God, it's so fucking nightmarish. Uh, there's only one spectacular dumbass that's on the list. One of the things uh, I've always, I think in comedy, you, uh, you end up having to bring in your own fears. Mm. I have always been terrified of MRSA infections, which I think is why this one came up. Because at one point, I think the line was, I, I'm like herpes. You don't get rid of Jonah yeah. Ryan. And like, you know, and the, in just one of the takes, I threw in the MRSA infection thing. Because I am fucking terrified of them. What? Yeah. Sorry, what is that exactly? It's just like a. It's like just a, a virulent a, strain of bacteria or virus. Uh, bacteria that is resistant to all the medicines, the oh. best medicine. Like yeah. you get them at health clubs and hospitals. It's in the Super world of resistant. like a staff of like a staff infection. It's mm -hmm. just really, really. And there's always been like this thing, like when like when the Ebola joke got made, there was always that part of me that's like, oh, man, is this going to come back to bite us? But Mar but my son one time got a tiny cut on his leg and he ended up getting a MRSA infection. Aww. And that was like one of the most stressful weekends of my entire life was like, you know, we had to like do the thing. He gets like these massive shots yeah. of of antibiotics and they draw a, a, a circle like in permanent marker around where the like the little you know like the little red welt is around the cut and it's a cut that's like a quarter of an inch long they draw a circle around it in permanent marker and they like send you home and they're like if that red blot goes outside of that marker line you come right back into the hospital yeah. and it did oh god and so we went back in they gave him like emergency room they gave him two more shots the kid's a trooper and then they also give you like a massively powerful antibiotic to take so like the two shots are to like kickstart it and again they were like if it if it goes any bigger than this so now we've got two circles and it did finally start to recede but if it had started spreading then what you have to do is you have to like go to the hospital for a week mm. and like just have, be on like a constant IV drip Jeez. of antibiotics. It's so crazy that I had no idea what this was. You already were scared of it, and then it happened. And to then yourself. it happened. Oh, and there's always going to be that part of me. It's like oh, it's because I it's because I made a joke of it. I wrote down um, one of Julia's lines that I thought was unbelievable, uh, very specific. She said, "Somewhere there's a woman my exact age." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Getting her pussy eaten and I'm stuck here. Exact age? What is that? Ha what? Why does it have to be like? The it's Luke. almost like doppelganger, but not quite. <laughs> Somewhere there's a woman my exact age, which means like there are like women over whatever age, you know, yeah. enjoying still their, living themselves. their best <laughs> life. Yes. Like, and I'm uh, stuck here. God, that's a fucking great. That is a amazing. great line. I wrote yeah. that. That is. Oh good. God. Do you have any other? What's your next thing you wrote down? Let's see. Uh, <laughs> I want you to make sure you go through them all. No, I got that. Was it? That was all of them. I like Doyle saying, "What's dental surgery code for?" Yeah. I like I, Seth Morris uh, hitting on a woman on the a, a, like an officer on the boat by saying, right. uh, "You can probably fit twenty pieces of corn in this bag." <laughs> That's like his pickup line, <laughs> which I suppose is why he has to see prostitutes. 
I was so yeah. glad I got to work with him. Like two episodes later, it was like Congressional Ball, and he was there. Getting, yeah. Like, and Julia, like, oh, he's with some like escort, some like Russian escort or something at the Congressional Ball. Yes. Yeah. 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 Who uh, said who who? I fully support your decision to live as an ugly woman. Who said that? <laughs> Amy says that to Dan. Yeah. I gotta talk to you about something. That's a great. Their relationship is so. Because he comes to her. Does he go to Ben in uh, Kent first? He must. He goes to Ben right. in Kent And then he goes to down. Amy. Yeah. Yeah. They do have a thing. Whether they do. Dan would never admit it, but he does like Amy He somehow. does. And also, it kind of seems like, it kind of seems like in a way of like, I mean, Dan's not a good boyfriend. He's not a, no. good, he's not a good person. No. But it also is like, it's only in times where he's at his lowest. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? Like, if he's not having a good time. He'll go to Amy. He'll go to Amy. Yeah, and like she'll he wouldn't open the have door. gone. To, he wouldn't have been like, "Hey, Amy, let's hang out." If Tom James had been like, "All right, you've got me. I, you know, you're yeah. on the team now." Okay. Uh, I want to throw this question out. Somebody emailed to ask you, Matt. It seems like some of the runners that you had went away throughout the seasons, like laughing at your own jokes or getting increasingly uncomfortable around servicemen. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. <laughs> and do you think that's the case? Do you remember that being the case? I think. To some extent, the service thing kind of went away. And what was the other one? Laughing at your own jokes. like the... Yeah, I think that faded by the end of the run of the season. I have a theory, too, because like similarly, like if you do something, if it's too pat and it's too good in a way, it's kind of like when Andrew comes on and he talks about business plans, mm -hmm. like when he, when he hooks Mike into investing in like a Brazilian oh, eco-tourism spot. Mm -hmm. There's something about that, and I, I can't explain it, but it's almost like, oh, that's too good. We don't need to revisit anymore. And I feel like, yeah. and it's not bragging. I, I see it in other characters, but I feel like the mics, thank you for your service. Like, it's too perfect. Like, it's yeah. just like done. <laughs> yeah. And there's something in that and whatever the other one is. I sometimes think that bits, because there's variation. Like, if, if back at all, Congressman Furlong throws the will and says, what is it, Will? I think they temper that. I don't think it happens every time, but nope. that has enough variation that it lives on. But some things, if they're pat and they succeed, it's like a dunk. It's like, well, we saw that. Like, yeah. I don't, yeah, I don't know that we need to go back to that. So, in some ways, I would guess that's why those things went away. Yeah, yeah, it changed for me. Yeah, there was used to be the tell them why will. Yeah, uh, that stopped happening. But I still did some version of that where he just sort of it was more organic or whatever than the like. Yeah, yeah. but like in the but. dinner scene when he's insulting your wife, that was just like, <sighs> hi. He says hi to Mike. You say hi, Mike. This is my wife. Yeah. <laughs> if you sit on top of it and you've already maximized it and you've dunked it, it's like we don't need. To, it's, yeah. It doesn't have anywhere to go. Yeah. So in some ways, those bits probably didn't have anywhere to go. That's true. Jill Brianna. Is that right? No. Okay, sorry. I don't think I'm not yelling at you. I'm like, <laughs> I'm not, I apologize. It's okay. <laughs> no. God damn it. There's another question that came in. I, I know how and I, uh, I know how much detail went into the show, so I'm surprised to see this because in the real world you would never see uncontrolled. This was regarding the introduction of Hugh Laurie in Storms and Pancakes when they're on the bus doing the funnel cake thing. Like you know, we, they kind of keep coming on and off mm -hmm. the bus. So this is going back a little bit. But they basically, they noticed uncontrolled traffic behind the bus, which they were like, that would never be allowed. Mm -hmm. You would never have like a stationary bus with traffic being allowed to pass by that the road would be completely locked down. Mm -hmm. So given the detail that would go into the show, uh, why, why was that allowed to happen? And the reason that I'm bringing this up is that uh, this always would happen with Chris Addison. Mm. When these questions of realism would come up, Chris would always say, if we get that question, I will personally write them a letter. Holy shit. Oh. So here's the thing. Chris, if you're listening. Chris, if you're listening and we're going to make sure you listen, you owe somebody a personally written letter. I don't know if Chris directed that episode, but it seems like when it came to the umbrella right. of realism in the show, Chris would always say, like, if we get a letter, I will personally respond to it. I kind of am of that school of thought sometimes. Like continuity, like if your thing is here and it's here, I don't know. Let's just move on. If yeah. somebody's thrown by that. I tend to side with Chris on those things, but it, it matters to people. It does. Yeah. It really does. Yeah. Yeah. And I do think there is, I mean, like priding ourselves always wanting to have the bits built out of realism and information delivered by people who would actually deliver it. It can be a hindrance, but it usually leads to 
better jokes. But at some point, you can't, like, you know, the show can't be about the people signing in at the security <laughs> gate to get into the building to then be in the scene. Right. You know what I mean? Right. So, uh, so yeah. So, uh, Chris Addison, you get to write a letter. Wow. Well, I want to ask Nelson one more question. Did you have a job before you were a working actor? Like, after college? Yeah. What was your job? I worked as a... I mean, it was I was more or less a carpenter. Uh, really? Oh, nice. Not in so many words. Like, I wasn't, like, going to people's homes or whatever. But I got a job working for a set designer um, who was... This was in 2007. Pre-pandemic. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, <laughs> I mean, a lot of things were... <laughs> yeah. A I'm lot sharp. of things were pre-pandemic. I'm on it. Which I'm on one? it. I'm on Which pandemic? Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Pre-COVID. Okay. Right. Post-1900s. <laughs> post uh, Gas engine, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so it was like two thousand seven. So there was like a there was like a, a he was a set designer who I I met him through mutual friends or something, and he was like I I just got a job working for the, like Disney bought a little production company to try and make webisodes. I have a lot of stories where I was working on webisodes because mm -hmm. it uh -huh. was like before streaming and they were trying to do something like that. Mm -hmm. So this place would have it was called Take One Eighty because each episode was three minutes long, one hundred and eighty seconds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Kind of like the original Quibi, original Quick Bite. I guess mm -hmm. so. I didn't know that's what that meant, Quibi, by the way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it is. Uh, rest in peace. Uh, so um, RIP. So they would have, they had five shows in there that they rotated through, and they each three minute episode. So we were constantly building these sets, painting them, moving them, oh, Jesus, moving them around for the other show, blah, blah, blah. It was just like stuff I had done in theater school already, built, putting up flats and stuff like that. So I did that. I just like was hammering nails and screwing stuff. In, and it was amazing because he would let me walk away to go do auditions. Oh, nice. flexing. Uh, he's like, look, I, I don't know how if I even need an assistant at this job. Like m most of the time I would do work while he was doing some other job. You know, <laughs> only one of us had to be there at a time, essentially. <laughs> so that's what I was doing. And before that, I used to work as an assistant. I went to college, but every summer I worked as an assistant for somebody. I was one time I worked for a line producer at Fox and uh, for the movie Flight of the Phoenix. Mm -hmm. The line producer assistant is not a job you want. Okay. <laughs> it's just mostly like digging through receipts. They were scouting all these deserts in China and she handed me a bag of like a shopping bag of receipts to go through all this. And I'm like, what? None of it's in English. I don't even know what the, you know, anyway. <laughs> it's, like, um, it's like a Veep episode. Uh, and then I, after that, I, w I was an assist, I, I, w I was an intern at Red Hour Films. Yeah. Uh, the Ben Stiller company. Um, I was doing coverage for free there, and okay. uh, eventually I got hired as an assistant to Stuart Kornfeld. Yeah. Yeah. The greatest. Uh, That's right. We've talked yeah. about Stuart. Yeah. He's a legend. Yeah. He is. Rest in peace, Stuart. Um, yeah. And then after that, I worked for, this is a crazy one, I was off the heels of Stuart. He finished the movie we were working on together, Tenacious D, mm -hmm. and he's like, I don't need you, sorry, but you know, I know someone who's looking for some help, and so he passed me off to Ricky Jay. I was Ricky Jay's wow. assistant. Wow. Um, but I was quite young, and it was hard to get in his good grade. He doesn't like young people, or he didn't. Rest in peace to Ricky Jay as well. Because he's a, you know, all intents and purposes, he's a magician. And, and be like, oh, show me a magic trick. And he's like, no, I'm like a scholar yeah. of the yeah. art form or whatever. It was a very serious thing for him. So it was cool. Those are the sort of the, those are the only ones I can remember for now. Is there any lessons that any of those jobs taught you that you use today? <sighs> Yeah, I mean, I guess so. Honestly, this is going to be my mandatory question because I'm obsessed like with how jobs. Right. Because I'm always telling my kids they have to get a job at some point because you learn so much about the world and you step into worlds you would never yeah. think are helpful. Yeah. So, look, my whole goal was to work on like show business adjacent jobs, mm -hmm. whatever job it was, uh -huh. something close to a set or in a production office or whatever. And it did pay off because when I was working as an intern at doing coverage, Stewart's assistant quit. And he said, I need somebody right now, you, you know, and that was yeah. it. I was there. So I worked for him for about a year and then he's the one who passed me on to, but here's the deal. Like that's how I got into show business. I was working for, for Stuart for a year and he would say, what do you want to do? And I'm like, I, I would say, I want to be an actor. And he's like, that's stupid. Just, you know, watch how bad this is. And we would have all these like 18 hour <laughs> so days stupid. and you know, at the end of some horrifying week, he'd be like, you see what a fucking nightmare this is? Are you sure you want to do it? And for, for the whole year I was like, yeah. And when I stopped working for him, he's like, what are you going to do now? And I'm like, I said, I'm going to try and be an actor. And he was like, still, you still want to do it. And I said, yeah. And he's like, okay, well. I'm not going to make it harder for you. And he, he set me up in a meeting with an agent right then in LA. No oh. shit. And it was Jack Black's agent, uh, Sharon, Sharon Scheinwald, yeah. who I had talked to on the phone a million times just as a way of being his assistant. I take this meeting with Sharon and I was like, look, 
there's no way you're going to sign me, right? Mm -hmm. And she's like, no, absolutely not. (laughs) Never worked a day in your life. And I said, yeah, I know. She's a big Uh, deal, yeah. And she said, uh, look, Stuart doesn't usually send me people, so as a courtesy to him, I'm taking this meeting, but no, I will not sign you. But, you know, this went pretty well. You seem like a cool guy. Also, I was wearing shorts to that meeting, and she said, hey, great to meet you. Wear pants next time. (laughs) So that's another You learned that. Uh, She said, if you get a job, call me back maybe we can talk and I said okay so I got my first job was in I got one line in the movie I love you man cool and it was I was there for seven days or something Mm -hmm. they cut like 90% of the shit out of that that I had in that movie but on one of the days I was there she came to Sharon came to visit her client Jason Siegel and she said oh Nelson whose assistant are you on this movie Uh, and I said, oh, I, I oh, got a I job. Think. I'm in the movie. And by the way, I love you, man, cast by Allison Jones. Once nice. again, she had also put me in the office. I had one line in the office, too. Nice. So Sharon says, oh, you're in this movie? Are you doing anything else? And I was like, yeah, the office. Nice. And she signed me like two hours later. No shit. To WME. That's... Having, you know, it was no experience. It's, it's, it's very, very lucky. You know, like there are certain things that were in my control. I got those jobs. Like I got the I love you, man. Yeah. Job. I yeah. got the one line role or whatever. So I put myself there. Yeah. But that was yeah. fucking lucky. That was really lucky that she. Well, you also to... were working around the thing you liked, which was entertainment. Yeah. yeah you made a true. point of taking those jobs and learning the lay of the land and those connections and friendships you built served you there is also that thing where like i understand that there are gatekeepers and like there is a converse certainly there are parts of that that are not good but a lot of this is it's a town full of very untrustworthy people (laughs) sure and so the fact that like you proved yourself for a year you proved yourself as someone who could be relied on for a year with Stewart, mm. enough that he would recommend you right and then you proved yourself to be like oh this is also somebody like you did all the work and it was proven that that you were a person she could trust sure it, it yeah. took a lot for him to because i'm representing Stewart when he sets me up in that meeting like yeah. if i'm a fucking asshole he looks like an asshole you know yeah. so i did have to put in the time with him for sure for sure yeah i mean like right. i just i think that there is that aspect of like Prove that you are somebody that really wants to do this, that you just didn't decide yesterday and yeah. now you're here and you're like, why aren't you representing me? Hanging in. Yeah. 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 Um, All right. We should wrap up. Right. Yeah. I think. Walk backs or double downs. We do a can... thing. If, is there anything we covered that you said that you might want to walk back or oh. double down on? If not, don't I'd like, worry. Okay. I, w- I would like to go walk back something. What? Veep's my favorite show. So that's why you succeed in show business. Yeah. That's why he's someday, manipulating us. That's you why know someday, he's manipulating us. Yeah, you're gonna, He'll if, say when something When they different. reboot Parks and Rec, that's why yeah. you're going to oh, be on it. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Thank you very much to, no, for Nelson. Real Nelson. pleasure. Was Thanks for having me. You guys are great. Thank yeah, you. I got you it. It's awesome to see you. Thank you for being with us. Uh, you can find us. Uh, we are second in command of Eat, Rewatch Podcast. My name is Timothy Simons. Matt Walsh. Uh, you can find us anywhere that you get podcasts. You can rate, review, and subscribe. Those are things that you could do. Um, you can... Uh, oh, we forgot to read we'll the reviews. We'll read one okay, next time. Okay, so next, tomorrow... Thanks for the questions. Thank you for the questions, and we're going to read reviews, good and bad, that you have written for us. Yeah. Um, all right, thanks, guys. Peace. Peace.